Hello everyone, my name is Cherie. In this video, I'll be sharing with you what I watched in the month of April. In honor of Arab American Heritage Month, about half the films I watched were from the Middle East. Countries included Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Tunisia, and the United Arab Emirates. There were some great films in this group, and I can't wait to talk about them. But before we get into the features, here are the shorts. In an effort to watch a narrative film from every year, I viewed three silent movies on YouTube. The Impossible Journey, also known as Journey Through the Impossible from 1904, The Palace of the Arabian Nights from 1905, and Charlie Chaplin's Behind the Screen from 1916. These all clocked in at around 20 minutes. While the first two films rely on special effects and colorized film frames, the third relies on slapstick character comedy. I really enjoyed Behind the Screen, which features the shenanigans at a moving picture studio, including mistaken gender identities, the old pie in the face gag, and a stagehand union strike. Great stuff. I saw Air in the Theater, starring Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, and it's really great to see them together on screen again. The film is based on true events surrounding Nike's creation of the Air Jordan shoe line. I really enjoyed this film and would recommend it to basketball fans and fans of the all-star cast. Amrika from 2009 is a co-production between the US, Canada, Kuwait, and Palestine. It documents the lives of a Palestinian mother and her teenage son as they move from the West Bank to a small town in Illinois where they face different hardships from the ones back home. About half this film is in English, if that matters to you. It's a fine film, but didn't blow me over. I watched the Saudi Arabian film Baraka Meets Baraka on Netflix. The film follows a middle-class man and a woman from a rich family who begin dating in a society where such unions are frowned upon. The film is critical of oppressive customs as seen through the eyes of its millennial protagonists. At the time of this movie's release in 2016, the country was at the end of a 35-year ban on movie screenings. The ban was lifted in April of 2018, two years after the film's release. I thought this movie was charming and would recommend you add it to your Netflix watch list. City of Life from 2009 was the last movie I watched in April, and having movie watching fatigue, I almost skipped it. I decided to try the first 15 minutes, then see if I wanted to continue. Boy, was I glad I did. This is the gateway film for people who have never watched a Middle Eastern movie. Its style is decidedly Hollywood, half of it is in English, and the issues are very contemporary. Set in the United Arab Emirates, specifically Dubai, the film revolves around three parallel lives. I loved this film. It's on YouTube. Check it out. Sorry, no clips for this one. Basya Bahar, or The Cruel Sea, from 1972, was the first feature film made in Kuwait. It's the story of a father who forbids his son to go pearl diving something his son wants to do so he'll have money to wed the woman he loves. This is an interesting look at Kuwait when fishing was the predominant occupation. The tale is tragic, but if you're interested, you can find it with English subtitles on YouTube. Couldn't find decent resolution clips for this one either. Osta, a 2005 musical from Lebanon that follows a group of artists who tour in an old bus, or Osta, performing a techno version of the Dob Key folk dance that shocks conservatives. <laughs> this was a fun film, but I have one nitpick. The actors were constantly out of sync with each other when performing the dance. They did not come across as a professional dance troupe, and I wish more time had been spent in rehearsals and during filming to make this aspect more believable. IMDB puts the runtime at two hours and 22 minutes, but the version I saw on Netflix was 1 hour and 53 minutes, so I'm not sure if I've actually seen the entire film. Beanpole is a Russian drama from 2019. In it, two women try to rebuild their lives in post-World War II Leningrad. I'm not sure who recommended this, but somehow it ended up on my library rental list. Although I doubt I'll ever watch it again, I was riveted from beginning to end. 
Lots of green in the color palette, which I found mesmerizing. Give it a watch if you enjoy depressing foreign films. Cairo Station is a classic Egyptian film from 1958. The story revolves around a mentally unstable newspaper seller, played by the film's director, who is madly in love with a woman who works as an illegal cold drinks vendor. Hind Rostam plays the love interest and was known as the Marilyn Monroe of the Middle East. As I was watching it, I kept thinking, if she cut her hair and bleached it blonde and tweaked her makeup, she would be a dead ringer for Marilyn. This is a great movie. It seems like a Hollywood film from the 50s. If it's still on Netflix, add it to your watch list. You won't be disappointed. At the time of its release in 2007, Captain Abu Raid was the first feature film produced in Jordan in more than 50 years. Abu Raid is an airport janitor who tells the town children made-up stories about traveling abroad. It's much more than that, but I don't want to spoil anything, and I highly recommend you watch it. It's on Tubi with English subtitles. This is a great film. I cried at the end. Dakra from 2018 was the first Tunisian horror film, and it was inspired by true events. The film follows three journalism students who become trapped in an isolated village while investigating a cold case. It's very creepy, kind of folk horror, and has a twist I didn't see coming. I can't see myself rewatching it though because the gore was a little too much. Proceed with caution. Edge of Tomorrow, also known as Live, Die, Repeat from 2014, might be my favorite Tom Cruise film. He plays a non-combat officer who is forced into battle with aliens and must relive the same day every time he dies. Emily Blunt plays a sergeant who trains crews to fight. I love this movie. I really need to buy it on DVD. Ennis Main, that's the Cornish pronunciation, Main, not Men, is a strange experimental folk horror film from 2022. Ennis Main means Stone Island and is about a wildlife volunteer who descends into madness while living on the Stony Island. One YouTuber likened it to Midsommar meets Skinnamarink. I can't say as I haven't seen Skinnamarink. It reminded me a lot of Jean Dielman due to the daily repetition of tasks the protagonist goes through. The look was just right for a 70s period piece shot on 16mm Kodak film and projected in a 4 to 3 aspect ratio but it really came off like a student art house film. This was the second film I saw this month where a red raincoat makes an appearance, the other being Dakra, and they both reminded me of the 70s film Don't Look Now. Free Guy from 2021. When a bank teller discovers he's actually a background player in an open world video game, he decides to become the hero of his own story. This was another rewatch. The story is so fun and the characters are so charming. I need to own this one on DVD. Huda Salon from 2021 is an international co-production between Egypt, the Netherlands, Palestine, and Qatar. Based on real events, it's about a young mother who is put in a compromising position and blackmailed. A very sad film. I will not be watching it again. Based on a true story. The Idol from 2015 follows the journey of a young Palestinian as he goes from family band wedding singer to a competitor on TV's Arab Idol, which is the Middle Eastern version of American Idol. I loved this movie. It was so heartwarming. Definitely worth a watch. The Internship from 2013. Two salesmen whose careers have been torpedoed by the digital age find their way into a coveted internship at Google where they must compete with a group of young, tech-savvy geniuses for a shot at employment. I love this movie. I don't know why it doesn't have a higher rating. A lot of people think it's a two-hour recruitment film for Google, and it might be, but if I weren't interested in filmmaking, I'd want to work at either Apple or Google. <laughs> Who doesn't use Google? Who wouldn't want to work for the company? Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle from 2017 and Jumanji The Next Level from 2019. In the first, four teenagers get trapped in the game Jumanji as adult avatars, where they must complete a quest in order to gain freedom. The funniest performance was Jack Black playing the avatar of a teenage beauty queen. In Jumanji The Next Level, the gang is back, 
but the game has changed. This one had me laughing as both The Rock and Aquafina channeled Danny DeVito. <laughs> These were rewatches for me. Love them. Need to get the DVD set. Can't wait for the third, uh, er, fourth installment. Murder Mystery 2 from 2023. I watched the original and liked it enough to watch the sequel. Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston play married detectives struggling to get their private eye agency off the ground until they find themselves at the center of an international caper. I thought it was good. I'd watch a part three. The Nile Hilton incident from 2017 explores the corruption of Egyptian police before the January 25th revolution. The plot was inspired by the murder of a famous Arab singer and the movie was co-produced by Sweden, Egypt, Denmark, and Germany. I have to say I'm not a huge fan of crime films. This was downbeat and not at all something I'd watch again. After reading the script for Norma Ray last year, I decided to rewatch the movie this year. The 1979 film follows a factory worker who, fed up with poor working conditions, becomes involved in union organization. The final film is actually better than the script I read. It's really great. Sally Field won a deserved Best Actress Oscar for her portrayal of the titular character. I thought 2023's Paint was going to be a biopic about famed PBS painter Bob Ross, but it turned out only to be inspired by him. Owen Wilson plays the host of a painting show whose world is turned upside down when the station hires a younger, better painter. It was lighthearted and cute. Just fine. No clips for this next one. Real Bad Arabs from 2006 is a documentary whose sole interviewee is Jack Shaheen, who also wrote the book of the same name. Countless examples of Arabic people as the bad guys in Hollywood films are used. And at the end made me wonder, are there any examples of Arabs as the good guys in Hollywood films? There's Salah from the Indiana Jones films, but the actor playing him is Welsh. There's a, uh, hmm, makes you think. Peace by Chocolate from 2021, though technically a Canadian film and not a Middle Eastern film, is based on the true story of a Syrian refugee family who relocate to Canada and start a chocolate business there. I love this film. I saw it for the first time last year and now it's on my DVD wish list. The Chocolate Factory is a real company, and I ordered and just received chocolates from them online. They are yummy. I haven't tried them all, but the milk chocolate caramel and the white chocolate mango are my favorites so far. Rima is a 2020 thriller from Egypt. It follows an orphan girl with psychic powers who fears her paranormal abilities may in fact be a curse. This topped the Egyptian box office when it was released. It ends on a slight cliffhanger, so I guess it's a part one of two. I've seen this listed under the horror genre, but it's really a thriller with some horror elements. Again, a film about criminals in Egypt with extremely melodramatic music. Not my kind of film. Renfield from 2023 was a bit gory for my taste. Nicholas Holt stars as Count Dracula's always loyal henchman Renfield who desperately wants to escape from his vampire master. The performances are good. Aquafina makes an appearance, which is always a plus, but I didn't love the film overall. Salinas from 1997 played as part of my local theater's flashback cinema series. It's a biopic of Tijano music star Selena chronicling her rise to fame and tragic death. What a breath of fresh air. Up until the very end, it's a feel-good film, and Jennifer Lopez is absolutely radiant. Such a great performance. I can't believe I missed this when it originally came out, but I'm glad I was finally able to catch it. Sorry, no clips for this one either. Tejouj from 1977 was the first feature film directed by a Sudanese filmmaker. Based on a classical romantic tragedy, it's the story of a forbidden love among the nomadic people of the eastern desert in 19th century Sudan. Honestly, the first 15 minutes were difficult to watch. It consisted of long takes of people walking and talking, followed by long takes of people standing and talking, followed by long takes of people sitting and talking. 
The lack of film grammar made it feel like a stage play. Also, the subtitles were white with no borders, and most of the lower frame images washed them out. I liked the soothsayer character, but other than that, this was a chore to get through. Through a Glass Darkly from 1961 received the Academy Award for Best International Film. It was also nominated for Best Original Screenplay, but lost to Divorce Italian Style. What did I think of Through a Glass Darkly? Uh, I thought it was fine. The story revolves around a mentally ill woman who is attended to by her father, husband, and brother. This is the fourth of Ingmar Bergman's 45 narrative films that I've seen. And while I appreciate him as a director, his films don't really speak to me. But I'll keep watching them, maybe I'll find one that does. Under Exposure is a 2005 Iraqi film shot in the docu-fiction style. The story follows a fictional film crew that struggles to make a movie during the 2003 invasion of Iraq and subsequent American occupation. It was the first feature film to be shot in Iraq after the beginning of the Iraq War. The film is like sad poetry and the ending is devastating. I have to remark on the beautiful theme song. And that was it. In summary, I watched 33 films in April of 2023. Three of the movies were shorts and 30 were features. 26 were new to me and seven were rewatches. 17 were non-English language films. I heart these ones the most. Thank you for joining me for my April wrap up. May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month as well as Jewish American Heritage Month and I've got about 85 movies to choose from. Until next time, happy viewing.